Hi, I'm Jeff Yager. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics at Arizona State University. And I'm joined here by Samrata Min and uh, Steve Davowalski. And the three of us are all in the Magnetic Resonance Research Center at Arizona State University. We're making this video to kind of cover some basics about um, getting NMR data and being able to process it, analyze it, and look at it. So what we're starting with this video is assuming that you already have some NMR data that you collected in our facility. Now you want to do something with it. Now while you can use software that's in the Magnetic Resonance Center at ASU, a lot of us are, want to be able to you know, work with this data externally, whether it be at home, somewhere else on campus, etc. And um, most of the um, data we now collect is on Bruker spectrometers, and Bruker provides uh, software that's free for academics uh, and students to be able to use the same software that's used primarily for collecting the NMR um, as data processing. And so we're going to uh, look at, at some of that today, and me as a novice in this is going to ask some experts on what we would do to, to get this going. So if I wanted to, uh, say, on my home computer, um, you know, be able to, I have some data from the Magnetic Resonance Center and wanted to be able to analyze it on my own, you know, personal computer, you know, what would I need to do uh, to start this? It starts by you know, picking a software package for analysis. And while there are quite a few, whether it's you know, INMR, Nova packages for things like MATLAB, um, other um, vendors like Varian, VNMRJ, etc. I, I want us uh, to make this just about looking at top spin because since most of the users and most of the data we're now collecting in the magnetic resonance center is from Bruker, why not just use the software they provide directly? So it starts with being able to get this software. And so where would I go, you know, to be able to find the software and download it? Well, like most software these days, Bruker just makes Topspin available online. So um, the only thing you need to be able to get Topspin is a Bruker account. So um, the easiest way to get there is uh, just go to Google and uh, type in Bruker Topspin. And there's a few links that come up, but... Uh, typically, the one you're looking for is the one that says free topspin processing software for academics. It almost helps so. just to kind of search academic yeah, download exactly. topspin, and it'll probably get you to this site yep. um, directly, right? So once you're here... Um, so if you don't have an account, you need to register for one? Yeah, right. So once you go to login here, um, or at the top here, it'll go to the user login, and you can register for an account here. And what do you need to be able to register for an account? I mean, just... Well, since this software is free for academics only, I think they require you to have a .edu email address. So just make sure you're using your university's email address because they'll send you a verification link to that email and verify that it's an edu account. And once you do that, you can log in and download the software. Okay, and, and, and so as long as I have my asu.edu account, about how long does it take, you know, from, I assume the form is just a few things long, right? Like, yeah. Uh, the, it sends you the email verification immediately. And so you can start downloading it, say, 10, 20 minutes after. Well, Steve, you've done this more recently, right? You tell us. Yeah, the account becomes active pretty quickly after you click the link, and then you can download the software. Okay, and about how big is the software, or current version? We're at, we're at top spin 3? 3.4 is out 4. now, yeah. So um, it's typically under a gigabyte, but it's a pretty hefty file, though. It's about 700 megabytes. Do you have a? Do you have the choice of which version you download? Uh, I think that you don't. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, but, I think it's. But you do have. I mean, uh, Topspin works on on Windows machines, on on Mac, uh, or you. Well, yeah. at least you can data process on Macs and on Linux, but Windows and Linux to drive the instruments themselves. So you can, so you must at least tell it, you know, which operating system, and then it, it, it picks kind of the newest version to... 
Right. You know, well, and here? I think, um, yeah, you're right. First of all, it's available for all the three major operating systems, and um, they're all separate files, so you can download it for the OS you're using. But um, as Steve said, you know, when you go to the main page, it has the latest version on there. But I think there's a little hidden link usually that lets you go down and uh, download previous versions as well if, if you, you need. need for specific reasons, yeah. So, but now if you go, you're going to be downloading as of you know, September 2018, you'd be downloading version four of Top Spin. Yeah, and okay. what you'll notice is that Bruker usually has uh, patches which they keep adding on and updating that software. So typically you'll see something like, uh, you know, 4.0.3 PL4, which stands for patch level four on that software. Okay, so. so once you download it, and I assume it just depends on your browser, but it usually goes to a download directory. Yep. Is it, uh, it's, I assume it's compressed? Uh, file? Yeah, it's uh, it's a zipped file. So yeah, you uncompress it. So basically, it and... any normal OS will be able to more or less automatically handle it. You have to uncompress it, and then is it a you know does it use DMG for Mac versus an execute? Does it it has package management where you just double click on? Yeah, and I want to say that's OS specific. Uh, if you download a Windows version, I think it's just an installation file that okay. you run through. Um, if you download the Linux version, uh, it's actually a script that you open a terminal and run that script. To and, make? Um, no, no. no. Um, it's just a script that runs okay. and unpackages everything and installs the whole thing for you. Okay, so. okay. And on Mac, is it a... DMG or is it? I think so. Yeah, I believe it yeah. is a DMG. Yeah, okay. right. So you can just double click on it and it'll. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So so it's pretty easy though, as long as you have the bandwidth to get about a gigabyte file down to your computer, mm -hmm. um, and you have the space on your hard drive. Now I assume once it expands, it, it's what about five, ten? I don't think it's that large. No? I, I want to say it's a couple of gigabytes. Um, so it's going to take a couple gigabytes yeah. on your on your hard drive. Yeah. And you need how back you can go as low as Windows 7? Because I know that's what we're running here. Or? Yeah, um, that's a good question. It, you might even be able to go XP, I want to say, but okay. you know, we've tried it definitely on Windows 7, it works. Windows 10, 10 it works, works fine, yeah. Okay. yeah. And so. then most, we would say fairly modern versions of Mac, it works? Right, yeah. Okay, right. and Linux, do you have to be specific? Do you need to Ubuntu, Damien? Is it a, does it require a certain, is the, Initialization like a C shell or a Bash shell, or there are specific distros of Linux that they recommend. Um, I think you can compile it for others. It just like anything Linux, is it, it take a little more work. Is right? it mostly but, kind of the CentOS, Fedora, yeah, Red exactly, Hat, yeah, uh, yeah, line that it likes. I think most? they prefer the the Cent operating systems more than others. That's what they recommend for the spectrometer controls as well. So okay, I'd recommend sticking with that. So, so you have it. You you install it. Um, from what I hear, rumor has it like sometimes it gets stuck in the installation process. Now yeah. I assume it's you double click it. Does it automatically just completely install? Do you is there some user options that you have to go through when installing? Yeah, there's a lot of options. Um, I think for data analysis and just basic processing, you can stick to the default options and kind of just click next all the way through. But um, typically, when you run through it, and um, one of the first options you get is what kind of installation you want to do. So you get the option of just data processing, whether you want to control a spectrometer or um, so let's some assume they don't options. have a spectrometer in their house. Yeah, some <laughs> Not, people do. Some people yeah, do. So, you yeah. know, you just never know when you that extra accessory is an NMR exactly. you know, at home. You know. <laughs> um, so uh, any other? I mean, we could probably spend a lot of time on this. Just little quirks of installing it, because yeah. from what I hear, there, there can be quite a few. But I, I think, um, is there any specific that really stand out that you think Windows specific users run into a lot? Because I think that's going to be the majority yeah, of people. I, from what I've seen, at least, I think Windows probably goes the smoothest out of the three. Linux is typically the one that gives the most troubles. I doubt. Um, yeah. There's actually a guide that pops up during installation that runs you through you know, some of the packages that you need to have installed on the system, especially for Linux. So they have a whole list of um, you know, third-party uh, apps. But in Windows, it doesn't require a specific Java or a specific Python, you know, any type of third-party stuff? It requires it, but I think it's bundled with the installer. So, so I think it goes it. through and installs it 
mostly on its own. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I've installed it on a few different Windows machines and haven't had any issues with that. Zero at all. Oh. If they ran into issues, I assume there's obviously help at, at Bruker. And I'd be surprised if you can Google and, and find some of these as well. So yeah. let's move to the next one. So let's assume we've downloaded it, we've double clicked it, we ran through a Windows installation, which we actually just finished, right? And, and exactly what you said, no problems at all. Yep. Now, by default, it creates these um, on your desktop. So these are, are, are just... Uh, uh, shortcuts. I yeah, assume. exactly. This was our installation file, by the way. So you can tell it's 930 megabytes. Okay. Um, so and it was it, so the one that was done is 3.5, like yeah. not four. Right. Okay. So uh, so version 3.5, and in a sense, uh, we just double click that, hit next through everything, and it installed, and it creates a couple shortcuts and the. What's the, I mean, the one seems very obvious, which is top spin. What's the other shortcut for us? Um, that's something I've never used, actually. Um, that's something we'll have to we ask have Brian for. We have a third-party yeah. person. <laughs> we need an expert. What is it? Yeah. It, it's a set of software that we don't have the license for. Okay. So we can just, uh, like, we could literally just, just get rid of that Delete this for now. Yeah. Yeah. Delete it. Okay. <laughs> so let's delete that one. Now we have one top spin, like you said, version 3.5. And it even opens up, okay. Okay, and so this would be what you would get, not quite as the base though, right? Like would it, uh, by default, would it have, um, you know, directories? These directories? I want to say it comes with one that has just example data um, every now and then. Um, right. yep. And uh, yeah, so like this, for example, right? So um, you can go through here, right click and kind of add whatever new data directories that you want. So you just click this, browse a path. and Where yeah. by default, so I mean, on a Windows machine, the most common, you know, still used is kind of C drive, mm -hmm. D drive. So I assume it puts it kind of on the local C drive. Does, yeah. it, does it have kind of a, you know, like you said, the default path that it, it goes is where? Yeah, so... Is it? It looked like it was C drive slash broker. Well, that's where the data is, right? Um, but that's not where all the... Yeah, I want to say most of the the installations when you do this are in an opt folder um, that's in the main directory typically. Um, in this case, I guess there's a Bruker folder and so C, Bruker, and then Topspin. But then that's, you know, let's face it, this is where you're, we're really gonna care about, right? Like, cause really it's about getting data uh, in onto Bruker directly. So right. so where it, its default is, is under the C drive, under uh, Bruker directory, and under data, yeah. right? After that. On Linux, you'll see it in the, the root directory under an opt folder. So. Okay, okay. Um, so, and it has basically a pointer when you go to the software that you, I assume you can point to several different data. Yeah. So I think most users will just go uh, to Spintropy or one of or a flash drive, copy their data to the desktop, right? So right. let's say you have a folder with a bunch of data there. You can just go here, add new data directory, and then you can browse for where that directory is. And then pick that folder, hit OK, and it'll actually mount that. You pick the option. folder where all the data is, not, you don't drill down to just the one set of data you want. Yeah, right? exactly. Right. Okay. So, so in, in that data uh, directory, you can have a whole lot of, in a sense, different experiments, different data, different, et cetera, right? right? So here's an example of... Um, so when you copy that data as well, um, it's typically copied as a zip file then so that it grabs everything or... Well, it depends. So if you use our uh, facility and you get data from Spintropy, it's going to be a zipped file, right? So, it, um, so they'll need to unzip that and then yeah. put it. Yeah, and once you unzip it, it ends up being just a folder. And once you dive into that folder, there's a couple data files inside. Okay. So, so in a sense, you could have here in this space, you could have it point to wherever mm -hmm. this data is, et cetera. Okay. Right. So I think with that then, I think the last thing we want to do, this has... Um, some data that we grabbed, um, we linked to it. Let's, uh, you know, just open one data set to uh, ethyl crotonate's fine and, and see what it looks like. So, uh, like you said, the most common experiment you see is just a ZG or a zero go for a pro and uh, a proton NMR. Mm -hmm. um, and all you really need to do is drill down into the directory and then 
um, you know, pick uh, one that is uh, one of the data sets. What's the difference here between one and two? So um, these are just different experiments that are run or different processes that are run on that same data set. So, um, you know, if we click through this and I don't think so, we can change there. But. And it even shows. So, so in some of these, I mean, if you have put it in there, you can have the molecular structure. You right. can, and so by default, it, it kind of has a window structure. Now I know it allows you to kind of change the view and do what you want, but mm -hmm. most people are going to kind of keep the default here. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I think at this point, what I would say, and and you can even see, like it it it, it has a memory of how it was already processed. Uh, right and, and integrals and stuff and I, I think that's what in the next video we'll start delving into is 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 looking at some of this data and what I would call just some very basic and common um, initial data processing and, uh, and analysis things that are used for simple uh, proton NMR but I appreciate thanks for walking me through sure. uh, how to get this going I, I'm we'll see if I can get it installed on my computer <laughs>